School is back in session for Ishgard's elite. Or perhaps not. It would seem trouble is brewing at St. Endelum's Scholasticate. What sort of prep school drama will we encounter today? Hey everyone, and welcome to the Aeorzean Archons. I'm FaZe. And I'm Catherine. Join us on our journey as we summarize this optional side quest from the Heavensward expansion. Beware of spoilers from Heavensward, as well as Hildebrand's questline in A Realm Reborn. We hope you enjoy! Hey, nerd, what are you reading? We're not in school. <laughs> it's not a textbook, Cat. Our good friend Count Edmund told me he wrote this cool book about our adventures in Heavensward. It tells of our defeat of King Thornton and how we uncover the truth about the Holy See's involvement in the Dragonsong War. The people of Ishgard must be in quite the shock to learn that their high houses started a war that never should have happened. So many lives lost for power. Speaking of school, though, I have a request from Ishgard's elite school, the St. Endelum Scholasticate. I completely forgot we were going to do that. Let's stop in the markets on the way. I need to buy some potions. Don't worry. I'll keep a record of the quest in our explorer's handbook so you don't forget later, like you always do. Yeah, yeah. Let's get going. Our journey begins in the jeweled crozier of Ishgard, where we meet with Matei. He has misplaced the record of sales for his most esteemed client. St. Edelman's Scholastic. Without it, he doesn't know what book they recently ordered and hopes we can go examine their shelves to find out what's missing. We chit-chat with the students and peruse the shelves to find out that Volume 11 of the 72 Articles of Holonic Polity is currently out of stock. We inform Matei, who thanks us for saving his reputation with the Scholasticate. Note, St. Endelim's Scholasticate is located within St. Raymanos Cathedral and maintains the scriptures of the Holy See. It trains prospective members of the clergy in medicinal and magical fields, as well as grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astrology, and music. Before we can collect our coin and head out, Matei mentions another problem he can use our help with. He says that the church is in a bit of turmoil due to the truth of Ishgard's history coming to light. Because of this, students of the Scholasticate are being harassed by angry lower class citizens and less likely to come outside to buy from him. Not our usual line of work, but I suppose we should see that this harassment stops. Matei informs us that we can find them on the road to the cathedral. As we wander the roads, we come across two students arguing with some rugged paupers. The two paupers shout at the students, saying their teachings cannot bring back those they've lost. They then steal one of the students' books and swear to destroy it before they can be destroyed by its lies. The paupers run off with the book. One of the students, Theomason, or Theo for short, chases after them, and we follow them down into the slums of Ishgard. In the broom, we find Theo outnumbered by the paupers, so we step in front to protect him. No, bullies only target those who wear glasses and are frail in stature. An easily avoidable situation with exercise and contacts. Turns out Leo knows the leader of these paupers, Ben, from when they were kids and asks him to return the book. We try to take a step forward, but Ben threatens to burn the book if we move any closer. The book in question is titled, The Parable of Saint Denethon, and is a book Ben recalls was given to Theo by Father Chisseau when Theo left the broom for higher learning. Ben is still jealous that Theo and Lee had the opportunity to leave the broom instead of himself when all of them had the same teachings growing up. As if on cue, Lee comes running in, demanding Ben not burn the book if he doesn't wish to get burned himself. Ben panics and throws the book in the fire as he runs away. Lee manages to put out the flames, but the book is very charred. The students turn to us and Theo thanks us for being here. Who knows what they would have done to him after burning the book if we had not been around. With that, they head back to the cathedral. As we leave, we can't help but get this feeling like someone is watching us. We report back to Matei, who lets us know that things have calmed down for the students and his business is nearly back to normal. Sister Gatell of St. Endelum's Scholasticate is here as well and introduces herself, recognizing us as those that helped reveal the true nature of the Holy See. She says that it was by our deeds that light was shown on certain inconsistencies in Ishgard's histories and the Church's teachings, the result of which is the encounter we just had, a struggle between those of the clergy and the common folk. She employs us to visit the halls of the Scholasticate to meet with the headmistress. Theo will likely be in need of saving again, so we join Gatell in the cathedral to meet with the headmistress, but unfortunately, it looks as though she's not in at the moment. A pity, but Deputy Headmaster Father Brevignan introduces himself instead. He and Gatell have been investigating a troubling event, perhaps related to the encounter we witnessed in the broom. 
One of the students was tasked with replacing the head of the St. Valerian statue in the center of the forum. However, the chiseled stone has vanished from the artisan's workshop. With the piece not holding any monetary value, one could only wonder if there was an ulterior motive. A mystery for sure. Did someone mention a mystery that needs solving? In walks Briarden, consulting inspector. Not as flashy an entrance as the inspector extraordinaire, but it's good to see our old friend again. Even if it is a little shocking to run into each other like this. Note, Briarden joined us on our adventures with Hildebrand when we solved the case of the Man of a Thousand Faces. His intelligence is currently in question though as he is still in love with Ellie, one of the villains currently serving time in prison for murder and thievery. We recover from the shock of seeing each other again, and Father Brevignan asks us if we know his nephew, Briarden. Briarden confirms that we do, and asks his uncle if he can have us be his associates in this missing head case, once again, signing us up for things we didn't fully agree to yet. Father Brevignan agrees to let us team up, but we must be discreet. As our first order of business, Briarden suggests we talk with the student in charge of replacing the statue's head. Of course, it's Theo. Theo tells us that he locked up the workshop whenever it wasn't in use, so he doesn't understand how someone got in and stole the stone head. Briarden directs his suspicions to the paupers in the broom, but Theo redirects the blame, saying he's never seen them before in his life and there's no reason they'd steal the statue pieces anyway. Besides, he says it's all his fault anyway. In a fit of panic, he excuses himself and runs off. Briarden suggests that we keep looking for leads. He heads off to the broom and asks us to snoop around the forum. It's not long before we find Theo again. He decides to come clean and tells us that he knows for certain that Ben has the stolen head in that crate. He wants to reason with Ben before demanding anything. We listen as Theo reminds Ben of the stories Father Chisseau would read to them at the orphanage years ago. Ben loved the stories about St. Valerian, so why doesn't he wish to see the statue restored? Ben argues that for all he knows, those stories were dirty lies too. Lee comes running to his friend's defense and calls out Ben for stealing the crate. Seeing this is going nowhere, we challenge Ben, but Theo stops us, asking we give Ben a chance to do what's right. Ben yells that he is doing what's right, but seeing he's outnumbered, he runs off, leaving the statue piece with us. Theo feels lost and questions the teachings he's received and the direction of the scripture he's studied. Seeing him distressed, we encourage Theo to forge his own path. Theo agrees, believing he should interpret the scriptures on his own. If the teachings were distorted by man's hand, then by man's hand they must be redeemed. We help the boys take the statue back, lock it up, and then return to Father Brevignan and Briarden. They ask where our culprit is, but before we can answer, two students come barging in. Archimbaden of House des Mill pushes past Theo, knocking the charred book from his hands, with his close friend Lebrissior just behind him. Archimbaden accuses Lee and Theo of consorting with the culprit. You see, these two followed Lee from a distance, only to see us let Ben run free after talking with him. They believe we staged the whole thing in order to prove our merit. Lee points out that we were also there as witnesses and know the truth. Arkham Bottom suggests that the next time the Scholastica assigns someone to work with the sacred monuments, they should entrust the task to him. And as for the tattered tome of children's lessons, he's more than happy to procure a new copy for Theo. House does Mel prides itself on its charity to the deprived. Seeing their point made, the two elitist students leave, tossing the burned book on the ground when Theo desperately asks for it back and trips. A student makes fun of Theo for being so hopeless, but one of the girls, Blasey, shyly returns the book to him, before running out and tripping herself. Father Brevignan warns Theo and Lee to be careful who they keep in their company letting them off the hook this time because we were there as witnesses. And this whole time, I still get the feeling like we're being watched. Man, prep schools are weird. Note, if the many character names confuse you, just think of this as a Harry Potter story taking place inside Hogwarts. Theo is obviously our main character, Mr. Potter, with his best friend, Ron, played by Lee. Our snobby, rich bullies, Archimbaden and Lebrissoir, are Draco Malfoy and Goyle, respectively. That, of course, leaves the lovely Miss Blasey as Hermione, who secretly likes Harry, as it should have been. With that mystery behind us, Father Brevignan asks that we assist him in another manner. He explains that most students graduate to become pastors, academics, and poets. Those that receive the highest marks are given the opportunity to serve in the vault. The stakes are especially high for those seeking the top three grades in the class, earning them the endorsement called the Trinity. Ranking was naturally determined by one's familiarity with the doctrines of the Holy See. 
However, with those doctrines being called into question, this grading is no longer an option. With so much uncertainty, there will likely be turmoil amongst the students. With that said, Father Brevignan wants us to be on the lookout for cheaters, those that may try to deceive or harm other students while the teachers work on an interim evaluation system. Note, prep school kids are not to be trusted, so it's best to assume everyone is guilty until proven innocent. To get started, we head over to meet Headmistress Sylvain, who has finally returned. We're warned she was appointed by the former Archbishop and may be a little old-fashioned when it comes to the curriculum. Best not bring up the whole Thornton incident. As we enter the headmistress's office, she thanks us for our assistance thus far and tells us that the Scholasticate was unaware of the Holy See's evil intentions, though they did play a part in spreading their doctrines. The staff agrees that they need to review the curriculum fast so that the graduating class knows what they'll be evaluated on. We get right to work with Briarden, checking up on the students to make sure no cheating occurs. We're appointed to the dormitory prefect, Arkhambaden, to start our investigation. Oh great, it's that silver-haired elitist. As we stop in to chat, his groupie, Lebrassoir, gives us a full introduction to Arkhambaden and as if he were an announcer to some world-renowned famous person. Before we can ask them anything, they recognize us as the ones that caused their curriculum to be re-evaluated. Arkhambaden jokes that all civilizations were built on lies and blood, Alamigo, Ulda, and even Limsa Lominsa. They are of the belief that Ishgard has gotten this far as is, and radical change would only threaten that. However, it's hard for these two to do their jobs as prefix and support the students' affairs if the students are all taking time off. If we want to get things back to normal, we'll need to get everyone back into school. There are a few students already out there trying to get people motivated to return to the Scholasticate if we want to go lend a hand. Sounds like a good way to find out what those students are up to. So we take to the streets again, looking for the recruiters. We first find the class flirt, Kramervoy. He's busy flirting with all the girls, and in doing so, getting them interested in joining the Scholastikit. Next, we find Theo and Lee. They want to convince their friends in the Foundation to apply for the Scholastikit so that they can motivate each other to score higher. Lee just wants to do everything possible to make sure that people like Arkhambaden don't make the Trinity. Seeing the kids are having success asking around, we head back to the Scholastikit to hear the results of the recruitment. Sister Cattell kicks off a meeting once everyone arrives to recount the results. Theo and Lee were able to bring back one student each, Jeanette brought back two herself, and Arkhambaden and Lebrissoir together brought back three students. Kramavoy, though, didn't end up successfully recruiting anyone. According to Arkhambaden and Lebrissoir, the girl Eula formally withdrew from the Scholasticate. They speculate that it was because she was a loner who often read the articles of Hellenic polity and became disillusioned with the faith after the recent revelations. However, Kramer Boy knows the book that they mentioned is not the one she was interested in when they last talked, which was actually volume 11, equal under her ever watchful gaze. In fact, it sounds like if anything scared her away, it was those two elitists harassing her for wanting to study a doctrine that they don't personally like. In order to spite them, Kramervoy decides to walk the halls and recite passages of Volume 11. Le Bressoir questions how he can do that since Volume 11 has been missing for some time now. Luckily, Kramervoy has it memorized. With that squabbling over, the students disperse back to their studies. Briarden finds it odd, though, that the girl would suddenly withdraw without explanation. Perhaps it's something we should look into. Briarden would like our help looking into why this Eula girl that Kremavoy invited had left the Scholasticate again so quickly. Our leads include accusations that Arkhambaden harassed Eula and that the Volume 11 book has disappeared. Father Saturnus has some further information for us in private, so we head outside to the plaza in front of the cathedral to talk with him. When we meet up with him, he's with Theo and Lee. He mentions how they sought counsel in their quest to obtain the Trinity seats. Father Saturnus believes in equal opportunity for all students, but isn't blind to their unfair treatment from the highborn students to the lowborn ones. The highborn believe that only they can become great clergymen. Lee doubts their chances, but Father Saturnus suggests that finding a fearless ally may help them overcome threats. We suggest that perhaps Kramervoy could help. Theo agrees as he's reminded of when Kramervoy defended Eula in the equality teachings of Volume 11. Lee, though, refuses to trust another highborn, no matter their merit, especially one who skips class or falls asleep when he does attend. Lee refuses to come with Theo to talk to Kramavoy, so we tag along to make sure he isn't harassed along the way. We find Kramavoy at his usual spot, once again flirting with the girls on the pillars. Theo tries to propose his new direction for the Scholasticate, but Kramavoy shuts him out, 
He'd much rather look at his lady friend than Freckles anyway. Undeterred by rejection, Theo chases after the two into the Foundation to try again. When we catch up to them, we find Kramervoy held at knife point by the young woman. Kramervoy looks at us, saying he told us he was preoccupied and that we should have left. He explains that she is seeking recompense against House Mangtony, and rightfully so. If he must give his life, then so be it. If Theo's freckled face is the last thing that he sees, at least favor him with a smile. No, an old friend once said, a smile better suits a hero. But Theo won't have him paying for his father's mistakes with his own life. He asks the lady to take coin as recompense, with himself acting as a hostage until Kramavoy can provide payment instead. Kramavoy at first rejects the proposal, but Theo insists that this is the path to making the world a better place, not killing one another over petty squabblings. His words move Kramavoy, who agrees to give up the wealth of House Mangtony as ransom. With Theo tied up, we quickly escort Kramervoy out to Western Corthus so that he can dig up his house's treasure. We stand guard as he grabs the coin and we quickly make our way back to Theo and the lady. Kramervoy hands over his entire fortune as payment and offers his sincerest apologies for his house's actions. Without a word, the young woman takes the money and runs off. We untie Theo as Lee finally decides to check in. Theo confides in Kramavoy that he too lost his father, and that he's willing to listen if Kramavoy would ever need a friend to talk to. Kramavoy explains why his house is so hated by the Lowborn. His father sought to gain favor with the Holy See, so he enlisted many Lowborns to the front lines of the rekindled Dragonsong War. When the small folk learned the truth of the war, they revolted and overran the Manor Guard, killing his father and five brothers. Kramavoy only survived because he was sent away by his father and decided to enroll in the Scholasticate to bring honor to his family. Despite the hardships, Kramervoy is willing to work at making Ishgard and perhaps the world a better place, with Theo as an ally. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. If they want to see changes in Ishgard, they need to earn the Trinity seats first. Seeing as our work here is done, we return to Briarden to report on the crazy run-in we had. Briarden has had a much less eventful search. Eula is still missing, and Volume 11 is as well. He assumes such a circumstance was one of intent, Somebody doesn't want us finding her, but we don't know who or why. Briarden suggests that we talk with the students to see if anyone that has returned knows anything about where Eula might be. We get somewhat conflicting information though. Some students think that she has lung rot illness, while others think that she left to join the revolutionaries. After talking with the students, we talk with Father Saturnus, who tells us that Theo and Lee headed out to Gorgane Mills in search of Eula. He's very proud of the fine young men they've become. We decide to join the search party, meeting the two students out in Corthus. We find them paying respects at the grave of Father Chisot, the man who brought them from the streets into the Scholasticate in the first place. They were hoping to find inspiration here in their search for Eula, and they believed to have found it in meeting back up with us. But, um, we came here thinking you had a lead, guys. Lee informs us that they still haven't found a single clue as to Eula's whereabouts. Well, no use standing out here in the cold, so we head back to the Scholasticate. When we return to the Scholasticate, we talk with Father Saturnus, who informs us that the latest rumor in the classroom is that Arkhambaden arranged for Eula to be taken away, though surely he wouldn't risk his position and house reputation. It seems like these rumors are being spread to so further divide between the social classes. He asks us that we look into these rumors and start by speaking with Lebrisoir, who is trying to find Eula to clear Arkhambaden's name. We find Le Brissoir in the pillars as he explains how he's hardly left Arkhambaden's side, so he knows for certain someone is unrightfully targeting blame on his friend. Either that, or the girl is playing us all for fools, hiding her way herself to cause this uproar. Le Brissoir then shares with us a secret for us and Briarden. He returns to us volume 11 of the Articles of Polonic Polity, which he found in Arkhambaden's room. It even still has Eula's bookmark tucked in it. However, he believes it was planted there and hopes we can prove that Eula is working with the revolutionaries in the broom to sow the seeds of chaos. With the incriminating book in hand, we rush over to Briarden to show him our latest clue. Briarden believes it's plausible that she intended to defame House Desmail by planting the book in Arkhambaden's room, but it could also be possible that Arkhambaden is a dumb criminal who leaves incriminating evidence out in the open. He suggests we follow the lead to the broom, though, to look around for suspicious activity and ask around about Eula. No, Arkhambaden seems like the obvious bad guy, but 
perhaps he isn't the real bad guy as mystery stories usually want us to expect the unexpected. But if they expect that, should we expect the expected? Hmm. Over in the broom, we hear that a nervous man draped in fine silks was looking to pay commoners to acquire cough syrup for him. The bartender confirms that one of his customers recently paid off a long-standing debt, giving way to the idea that this mystery man found somebody willing to get him the goods he required. With this new information, we return to Briarden, who also surprisingly made some progress. He confirmed that the bookmark in Volume 11 is Eula's, as the signature matches her record found in the library's registry. This also gives us a relative timeline from when she had the book up until the time it was discovered. To confirm his theories, he asks us to use the Echo to see visions of the past. And so we explain to Briarden how our ability doesn't quite work like that on command. Briarden tells us that he'll take over our investigation into the broom, and asks us to instead go and find Blasey. She and her friends have been doing their own investigations into Eula's disappearance, and may have useful information. We ask around to see where we could find her, and get word that she's out at the Ark of the Venerable with Theo. We head over in time to find Blasey secretly watching Theo from afar. She claims to be working on her investigation, but for all we know, she just likes Theo. Anyway, she introduces herself as Briarden's younger sister. Goodness, how many relations of Briarden are we gonna run into? And of course, it seems as though it runs in the family, she has no useful information on the case for us. Only a stack of notes and some testimonies she's recorded. It's at this point that Theo, Lee, and Kramer Boy spot us and come over. Blacey hands over her huge stack of notes to Theo to review. For what feels like an eternity, Theo reads out 21 testimonials. He's not even a third of the way through before Lee breaks in, saying that none of this is relevant. We all decide that we need someone to sit and sort through the information, so we decide to take the notes to Briarden. Payback for all of those tasks he's made us do in the past. We return to Briarden, who actually has useful information for us. He found a connection between the man who paid off his bar debt and the man who recently bought cough syrups. Turns out, they both share a unique facial feature, which is a scar running from the top of his left cheekbone to his jaw. This conveniently fits the description of a notorious thug who hangs out around the tavern harassing patrons for coin. Now, he apparently works as a traveling merchant after his fortunes suddenly improved, but what he sells is anyone's guess. We share with him his sister's transcripts from the townsfolk. As he skims through it, a few entries stand out. One in particular speaks of how a merchant has been buying out whole stocks of cough syrup and has been reselling it to another client. Very suspicious. According to the frequency of his recorded visits, we should be able to catch him at the merchant's stall soon. We head down to the jeweled crozier in time to find our mystery customer making his shady deal. We follow him at a distance outside of Ishgard until we come across a caravan. We run ahead of the transport and cry out, INSPECTION! so that Briarden can sneak around back and peek inside. But the guards are not buying our distraction, forcing us to knock him out instead. We check back in with Briarden only to find that our suspicions were correct. Eula is in the back of the caravan. It's clear that she has been kidnapped, though thankfully not physically hurt. We call over to the Ishgardian Temple Knights to deal with the thugs while we take Eula back to the Scholasticate. We give Eula some time to heal and relax before bombarding her with questions. While we wait, we turn our attention to the little information the kidnappers have revealed so far. They admitted to kidnapping Eula for coin, but couldn't say who their employer was because they wore such thick furs. They couldn't even tell if they were a man or a woman. In time, we'll have more information as the knights interrogate the thugs farther. Let's just hope that we can get to the bottom of this soon. I can't shake the feeling like our mystery troublemaker is going to act soon, whoever their target may be. We take a short reprieve from the school, but come back as soon as we find word that the Temple Knights were able to question Eula and the thugs further. They say that the only new information they gathered is that the thugs were once orphans, raised as charges of the Holy See. Note. Interesting that the thugs who kidnapped Eula were once orphans. Perhaps they are friends of Lee's, who may have motive to bring down the High Houses. Blacey jumps in to mention that the allegations against Arkhambaden are spreading once again, except this time the students are calling for his expulsion. We better calm down the students, so we head to the classroom while Briarden does some investigating at the vault. Upon entering, we hear everyone throwing accusations around and calling for action against Arkhambaden. 
We try to soothe the crowd and encourage them to rally with Theo. As Theo opens the floor for civil discussion, it's clear that everyone is on board with getting revenge on Arkenbaden for the way he has treated them. But Theo insists that Arkenbaden should be innocent until proven guilty, and there is currently no evidence tying him to the kidnapping. The other students collectively see Theo as being a sucker for the nobility, and instead leave to start a petition for Arkenbaden's expulsion. Only Lee, Kramavoy, and Blasey stay behind with us. With little time to prove Arkenbaden's innocence, Theo suggests we speak with Father Saturnus for guidance. As we catch up with him, he asks us if we're here regarding the petition he received from the student body. He assures us that he will be submitting the petition to the headmistress shortly, along with his own strong recommendation in favor of Arkenbaden's immediate and irrevocable expulsion from the Scholasticate. Theo tries to explain that there is no evidence, but Father Saturnus surprisingly states that he doesn't need evidence. He wants to end this vicious cycle of corrupt men and women entering the church and building its foundation on sin instead of virtue. Father Saturnus explains how he too was an orphan that was taken under the wing of Father Chisot. His devotion to his studies rewarded him with a position in the archives along with some of the Holy See's most esteemed individuals. It was here that he watched his closest friend and confidant struggle for ten years to keep Ishgard's past a secret, all the way up until his friend took his own life. The next years of pain and grievance were overcome through religion as Father Saturnus went from student to teacher. Volume 11 teaches that a fury's love will all men receive, and by the balance of her spear will all be set free. Arkenbaden has done nothing but scorn the teachings of Halone, and so Father Saturnus would see him removed. Even Lee sees the madness in blaming Arkenbaden for the sins of countless others. But Father Saturnus is certain the only way forward is to remove those that believe all men are not born equal from the church. The goal seems just, but the means are all wrong. It seems like the only way to sort all of this out is to talk with Arkenbaden himself and explain the situation. Perhaps we can find a way to come to a common ground before anyone acts irrationally. Note, Father Saturnus' actions are very suspicious. He clearly has a grudge against Arkenbaden and the High Houses, but it's unclear if he had a hand in the kidnapping or the planted book. Lee now seems far less suspicious than previously believed. We find Arkenbaden out in the courtyard, clearly upset with the accusations against himself and the letters sent around arguing for his expulsion. We soothe his anger by assuring him that we don't believe the rumors. Instead, we aim to help him plead his case of innocence. Judging by the letters scattered about, it seems as though the arguments made against Arkenbaden are built solely on emotion with no evidence to back it up. It's unclear who sent these letters around to the students. Arkenbaden isn't exactly happy to receive help from commoners, especially from those who would benefit most from his removal. Theo tries to convince him that he isn't after the top spot in the class, he only wants to follow in the footsteps of Father Chisot. His words fall on deaf ears though, as Arkenbaden and Lebrizur decide to deal with this on their own. We head out with Theo and Lee to track down where these letters calling for Arkenbaden's expulsion are coming from. Perhaps they will lead us to the source of this uproar. In the Scholasticate, we reconnect with Kramervoy, Blasey, and Jeanette. They all claim that the letters were inconsistent in detail, and only certain members of the school have received them. We find three versions in all, with the only relevant point of argument being that Eula's copy of Volume 11 was found in Arkenbaden's room. Come to think of it, when Eula was kidnapped, she didn't have the book on her, and we know that after she went missing, the book was gone. Therefore, whoever is stirring up all this trouble personally aimed to frame Arkabaden all along and took the book directly from her room. Seeing as we have all the information we're going to get, we decide to meet up with Briarden again in the courtyard to go over the evidence. After looking over the letters, Briarden smiles, confident he knows who our culprit is, and assumes we know as well. Note, Briarden's guesses are right maybe 50% of the time. It's best to take his confidence with a grain of salt. Before we begin, Briarden asks the students if any of them know where Eula's copy of Volume 11 is. Lee guesses Arkenbaden has it based on the letters, but acknowledges that it's probably a lie. Briarden reveals that he has it, as it was given to us by Le Brissoir. Now the only people who could have stolen Eula's book from her room are those with keys to the students' rooms. There are only three people that have keys, and they are Father Saturnus and the prefix Arkenbaden and Le Brissoir. With all of that in mind, we decide to pay Le Brissoir another visit, and Theo has a plan. 
We head over to House Desmel residence to find Arkenbaden and Le Brassoir discussing how they haven't been able to prove his innocence. Theo encourages Arkenbaden to plead his case in the upcoming hearing, telling him not to worry, and looks over to Le Brassoir to gauge his reaction. He even points out how we're in the presence of the Warriors of Light, of whom you cannot hide secrets from because we can see into the past. Seeing all eyes on him, Le Brassoir realizes he has no use but to come clean. He states that surely the Warriors of Light have used the Echo by now to see the past and determine it was he who kidnapped Eula, stole the book, and wrote the letters against Arkhambaden. After all the transgressions and humiliation that Arkhambaden's family committed against his family, Lebrissoir was done with being loyal when the truth of the Holy See was revealed. He took it upon himself to stage a plot to dishonor the House Dismail name for the satisfaction of seeing the High House fall, and to think this whole thing was made possible because Arkhambaden entrusted Lebrissoir with his finances and friendship. Well, let's see. That's motive, opportunity, and means. Yep, checks out. Leo thanks him for the confession. It's at this point that Lebrissoir realizes we didn't actually have a vision of the past, and he just openly admitted to the crime. We tell Lebrissoir that we'll escort him to the hearing in order to confess again openly to the Scholastic. But Arkhambaden hangs back with Theo. He's still hurt that his lifelong friend would betray him like that. Theo encourages him to open his heart and let Halone set him free. Only then will he be able to trust in Lebrissoir again, as an equal, and mend their relationship. When we get back to the Scholasticate, we join the headmistress and the teachers for the hearing of Arkhambaden's case. Lebrissoir confesses to them that he was behind the dirty deeds. But in some twisted irony, Father Saturnus jumps in to say that this confession may have been coerced. And expelling Lebrissoir or Arkhambaden, who have strong ties to House Desimail, could cause the school to lose credibility in the eyes of the citizens. Instead, he would propose that the whole school publicly close down while they reform the entire school. And right on cue, Bryden comes barging in with Theo, Lacey, and the Temple Knights, announcing that he has heard the confession he has been waiting for. He says that Saturnus is no clergy member at all. The documents admitting him to his current position were all forged. He used his false position to manipulate the students into calling for reform. He even manipulated Lebrissoir into acting as he did in order to get the school closed once and for all. Over a decade ago, Saturnus graduated top of his class and was welcomed into the ranks of the Holy See. That much has always been known to be true. But what he hid is that he worked as a watchman of the expurgators, a job in the bowels of the Holy See that only a select few, including the Archbishop, knew about. The job of the expurgators was to stay isolated from society and to keep the hidden secrets of Ishgard's past, not in writing, but orally. For this reason, only commoners were selected to be expurgators. In times of a new archbishop being named, they would call upon them to reveal such secrets. It was Saturnus's job to guard these expurgators, essentially acting as a jailer. Obviously, no highborn was chosen to be a watchman from the Scholasticate. Only commoners and orphans like Saturnus, who had no ties, would be subjected to such a fate. Saturnus's friend, who ended his own life, was one such expurgator. His friend couldn't stand the burden of carrying Ishgard's dirty secrets. No longer wanting any part in it, Saturnus fled the dungeon and took up a false identity in the Scholasticate to try to close down the institution that was unknowingly sending their orphan students to be watchmen. He believes this twisted institution should be closed down for good. Given everything that has come to light, the headmistress suggests that we close the Scholasticate while we investigate the claims. But Theo suggests that we'd only be showing a disservice to the clergy and further push the distrust of the church. Surprising to everyone, Archimboden agrees. He shares that he's learned firsthand that we must take care not to abuse our power and privilege, and to keep silent would be to repeat the mistakes of the past. Instead, we should treat each other as equals and trust one another with the truth, so that we may work together towards a better Ishgard. As they take Saturnus away, Theo assures him that his words about the secret expurgators will not be forgotten. We'll work to right those wrongs, but we'll do it with less kidnapping. And so from that moment on, the Scholasticate would set out to see a renewed faith in the church and the teachings where the citizens would come to learn that all men should be regarded as equal, not only in the eyes of Halone, but also by one another. But we'll leave that to the students. Even Arkhambaden is willing to now lend his connections and wealth to Theo's cause. And as for Briarden, he has a certain young lady to go visit in Old Oz Jail. 
I can't believe Briarden is still simping for Ellie. She's a murderer. Some people never change. Arkham Baden did. Rather quickly, I suppose. But the shock of his best friend's betrayal seems to have snapped him out of his prejudice. We definitely didn't expect that he was behind it. I had to cross out a lot of notes in the handbook with all our bad guesses. They were all very suspicious. These prep school kids are not to be trusted. Or their teachers, apparently. Well, at least I know I can trust you, Cat. You would never betray me, right? Right? If you enjoyed the video, please help support the channel by dropping a like and letting us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoy Final Fantasy XIV lore summaries, consider subscribing to the channel. Now that you've finished this summary, we recommend checking out our summary of Hildebrand's story in A Realm Reborn. This is the storyline where you first meet Briarden when he goes on a crazy adventure with Hildebrand. Thanks for watching.